Dudes, what's happening? It's Trent here, and I want to kind of do a little bit of a follow-up to my last piece, which was the, the Belgard time-lapse uh, illustration. I talked a little bit about some compositional techniques, but I wanted to dig in a little bit further on that and kind of showcase uh, some, some things to keep in mind when you're putting together or when you're assembling a, uh, a sketch or a, uh, a thumbnail, because so much of your image you want to keep in mind before you even do an illustration, your whole image should be readable from a thumbnail sketch. And the, the real kind of thing you want to keep in mind with that is that you've got basically three levels of uh, values that you're going to be using to define the depth of your scene. So for instance, you'll have your, your, your pitch black, or your, this is like, if you look at it on the, uh, on the color wheel, it's almost entirely black. And then you can have a, uh, a layer above that that is uh, set to multiply, and that can be, um, that can be about like a, a maybe a 75% gray, and this can be, let's actually go a little lighter than that. And this can define your middle ground. So let's say you've got some like a tower or trees or something like that. Um, and then of course you'll have your, uh, your maybe 20% gray on another layer. Let's actually set that to darken because it's, there you go. That one should be a little bit lighter even. So essentially, if you're working with these kind of uh, values, then you're going to have an immediate read on your, on your layout. And there's a couple of things to keep in mind with this, the most important of which is readability. So when you're looking at the thumbnail, you'll be able to know what you're looking at. And uh, so we're gonna do a couple of little thumbnails here just sort of as an experiment to kind of showcase some different compositional techniques that I tend to use. With something like this, I would do, uh, let's say we were gonna do a landscape and let's say that it's, you know, uh, obviously like, you know, it's starting to already kind of look a little bit like a castle. Um, and this is the way I would start any image is to kind of like start to rough in. Uh, ideally, I, I tend to go a lot more gestural and shape heavy uh, with my designs. So I tend to do things where like, I'm gonna have some crazy like like clearly I'm gonna make this this area look like a, uh, a castle something that's a little bit more traditionally medieval or um, uh, maybe you know old uh, old type of palace sort of structures um, and then I'll have something really weird sticking out of it like a like there's a massive like a, a hook you know or a, a gate or something like that or uh, possibly like a statue, you know, some element that really makes this a unique and distinct silhouette read and a unique and, and distinct shape read on it. You know, the second thing to keep in mind when you're doing something like this, because this is mostly kind of like a straight on shot and I'm gonna show you some other examples with different angles and things like that. But the next thing that you could do is kind of use the, um, use those three layers to create a little bit of depth. So for instance, if you have these kind of uh, tree shapes, you know, as, as they're, they're, they're coming up into the foreground, let's say you've got these kind of like pine trees. These are kind of crummy pine trees, but they're just, this is all just a thumbnail. You don't wanna, uh, this is kind of a key thing to keep in mind is to not put too much pressure on yourself to make it readable right away anyway. Well, if you have these in the foreground, they kind of set the scale for a foreground element. So you could actually have like a little character here. Uh, and we can't really see that he's a character yet, but we'll give him a little staff. Let's say that that's like a guy and he's kind of overlooking this, you know, shot of the valley uh, that sort of leads up. You could actually have like a river here, something like that. And, uh, and then if you've, got, if you've got little smaller versions of those triangles way back in the distance, then you immediately get this sense of, of scale. Because these trees, these shapes, these are the same shapes. They're just a smaller version of the same shapes that we're seeing over here in our foreground element. 
Now, this is essentially what, what you call value contrast, is what we've got with our three different um, three different values. And this is just very very basic stuff, but um, it should really help a lot of people if you if you struggle with like compositions. These same principles can apply to uh, to illustration. It doesn't have to be just for just for uh, environment, uh, 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 landscapes, and things like that. Uh, this can this can also apply to if you're doing character shots or something like that. Um, you could you could dig in and and uh, add like you know more layers of depth to this, but um, you have to be careful because then you'll lose your readability. You know, uh, and then of course you know the darker the higher contrast things are in the foreground, then the uh, the more it, it creates a sense of depth. And we wouldn't really add in too many details here. This is like just for a thumbnail layout. So if I were given a task to design a illustration of, of a setting or something like that, I would do something that's sort of like this. I might actually, you know, also add in like, you know, some clouds and like a slightly lighter uh, thing, but keep that value or keep that contrast really low for background elements and keep the contrast really high for foreground elements. Okay, so that would be sort of one way to approach uh, thumbnailing out a scene. Um, maybe another, let's see, if we were going to do the same shot though, but you know, create a more dynamic angle, something that I do, I do this with photography all the time as well, where I'll create, well, first of all, let's kind of fill this, let's fill this in here. So something that I do with photography is a lot of times you'll take shots, you'll take these little snaps and, uh, and you know, I was like at a wedding the other week and, <laughs> Uh, we were taking all these pictures and I noticed that if I do a, I, I noticed this years ago, but I, I, I do this, I, I subconsciously, I don't even realize I do it. A lot of times I'll just turn the camera like a little bit. It's like a, just like a 30% horizon turn on this. By turning the camera, I think they call that a French tilt. And uh, I don't know why it's called that necessarily, but I, I kind of jokingly do this and then I get into like action photography pose where I'll like kind of squ like squat down like I'm shooting some kind of a, like a tennis match or something. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so you, you add a little bit of that tilt to it and it suddenly makes your shot seem, so like if we start to thumb in, we're gonna do the same kind of a, a structure, the same kind of a, an idea for our, our castle, we've got our statue here. And uh, maybe our palace roofs. I could technically just copy paste this if I were really in a hurry here, but screw it, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, so you'll notice that uh, it immediately kind of gives the, the, the scene, the entire scene has a slightly different feeling now. It's like it's, it's slightly more dynamic. Another thing that we're doing here is, because um, let's add in our guy with our, he's got like a little staff. He's just standing there like he's got his arm out, maybe a robe or something, just representing where he'll be. And, um, we kind of want to, I'm just going to draw in some lines here to kind of show the flow of things. So we've got this kind of like horizon thing going on like that, but we're also going to have this kind of uh, angle where we're pushing the viewer's eye. The, the viewer's eye is going to be kind of going toward the castle. And, uh, and this is where it faces a wall that's sort of an abrupt wall. And that's going to, that's going to be what kind of is our focus of our image. So in doing that, we kind of draw the viewer's eye exactly where we want them to look. And by no means is this like super hardcore advanced stuff, by the way, guys. Like this is just something that I'm trying to like dissect what I sort of do automatically, things that I've learned to just sort of do that are sort of my, my fail safes, like things that I fall back on that always sort of help me when I'm uh, trying to figure out why is my composition not working in this shot or why is, you know, how do I make a more dynamic angle on something? Or uh, well, sometimes it's just a matter of taking your, taking your image and rotating that camera a little bit 
and checking to see the flow like of, of where you're guiding the viewer's eye. You know, here is a great opportunity, by the way, if we've got, I'm going to just, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to do, I'm going to do a tree. I'm going to make a little tree here. Since we're just doing little, little thumbnails, these are really sloppy, but, and I'm going to dissect some, some paintings that I've done towards the end of this video here and kind of show you how I've applied these things in paintings that I've done really kind of analyze stuff that I've already already done. So uh, by grabbing that, it's on its own layer, so you can um, you can copy and paste it, and then um, bing, bang, and a boom, you just move it around like however you want. Uh, and then let's, let's copy another couple of them here. This is actually kind of how a lot of um, storyboards are done for films. They just kind of do these like three value um, images to kind of get the idea down. And this is a great opportunity. Remember we were talking earlier about setting scale. You know, let's say we've got our middle ground here. Oh, interesting. Hmm. You know, we can actually create a sense of depth because we have the same, it only really works because we have the same object in the foreground, the same shape in the foreground. That's the only reason why that works. And then we can actually add it in to the castle if we do a tiny little, let's zoom in just a little bit. This is really messy, but hopefully, hopefully I'm communicating this well. Um, and hopefully this helps you to kind of get through some of those tougher compositional things. I noticed that just nobody really talks about these things uh, on on, in their videos. I, I, I've watched a few gumroads by some really great uh, environment concept artists and, and I was just like, wow, you know, like you're not actually showing me the, the, the real meat and potatoes of like how to put together co better compositions for my pieces. And that's, that's really why I wanted to do this video because as, as basic as it is, it's not super glamorous. And I, and I, I get that, like, you're not going to see a really amazing painting come out of this, but these are fundamentals that can improve any artist uh, presentation. So like a cool river, why did I add that little river shot there? Well, because you've got this interesting flow. You remember we were talking about, let's, let's pull this layer up, but, but let's kind of delete it and start a, a new note here. So what we've got here in terms of composition is like we have our focal point, which is gonna be here. And we know that that's our focal point because we've got this big strong line pointing right at it, you know. Um, it would be really great, by the way, is if we can have more clouds coming in, really pointing our attention, like especially if they're kind of angled and swooping. God, I'm giving I'm giving you all of my secrets here. I do these like kind of angled swoopy lines because those are doing this. They're just bringing the eye, bam, right into that castle. You see all these arrows that are happening. This isn't so much, but there's a little bit of a, 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 a little bit of a flow here because of the angle of that river, how it turns. And so, uh, but mostly in the clouds and in this, this strong contrast line here, and then even the horizon itself, which we're subtly seeing and we're, we're, we're noting it, even though we're not being very super obvious um, about it. And so you'll notice that this is a far more interesting and dynamic camera angle than what you have here. Part of it is also because I'm breaking the frame and I shouldn't be doing that. I should actually white that out because it's sort of uh, deceptive. If you can, it's, a, it's kind of a comic book trick to break the panel. Uh, a lot of comic book guys will do that, but you'll, st you'll see that the piece still has really strong contrast. So what else is happening here in terms of the composition? We can also note that the composition is and you'll notice I'm just making new layers as I need them. I'm not being optimal with my layer management here. Don't worry about that, especially with your thumbnails. You're going to flatten all this stuff down anyway. So let's let's make a selection. Let's actually let's find out like how does that change our piece? So if we copy and then we paste that, and let's say that we make that larger or we just move it over. Well, that really imbalances our 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 image actually. Let's fill that in as if it were completely full. Now what we have is an imbalance because we're like one, we've got 50% of our image 
is more than 50% of our image is this foreground thing. And that's not even really the focus. Now you could do this, I guess, but it really doesn't have as much of a comfortable flow as this because it's just hogging. It's, it's hogging the whole scene, you know? Um, it doesn't uh, uh, break up nicely and it doesn't give us any areas to breathe. Like without it, we've got these cool, this softer contrast thing through most of our piece and this harder contrast stuff that our eye almost just sort of like blurs out. It becomes peripheral. It's not really the focus of the image, you know? And then we've got this middle area down here that just sort of reminds us, hey, there's like depth here. There's depth in space. And actually, you know, what you could do here is actually add a little bit of like a, uh, um, I'm going to do a light and layer. First of all, you fill that in, but what we'll do is we'll back that off, you see. So you see how it's not fully high contrast. It's not like the full black, like what we see in our foreground. So clearly our brain is filling in the, the information here and going, oh, okay, so it's not full contrast. It's like 50% contrast of this. So it's got to be about 50% in the distance. And you might actually find that the castle would look better if you did a, um, let's airbrush that a little bit lighter. Oh, it's set to, eh, no, it's not set to darken. Yeah, like you can actually back that off a little bit more and you've immediately got yourself a really nice contrast and a cool atmosphere too. You can really play around a lot with adding atmosphere by you, you know, hitting your backgrounds with a lot of splashes of airbrush. So I wasn't sure how many of these thumbnails I was gonna do, but uh, this actually kind of communicates most of what I wanted to talk about for composition. Uh, there's a few other, let's, let's just kind of kind of go through maybe, I had an idea for like a couple of other compositions. You generally don't want to do something that's right down the middle. Um, this particular castle, let's let's actually try it. It might work um, if you're going for something that feels very orderly. Generally, symmetry is going to have an orderly association. And if you are doing symmetry, you know what, dude? just use the symmetry tool. It's right up here, up in your bar at the top. You just drag that over to the middle part. And then since you've already sort of drawn in a little bit, you can actually uh, just trace what you've got on one side. So that way you don't have to draw it twice. And you can actually, this is great if you're doing um, more like, I guess you'd say, uh, like uh, model sheets or something like that. If you're doing like model sheets where you need to break it down for a modeler or something like that, you know, it's really great for that. Um, or if you're really just trying to get an idea down quickly, but generally speaking with something like this, it's not going to be, and you'll notice we're going to take a look at the differences here. It's not even perfectly centered. Let's, the, the sky is going to bug me if I don't uh, fill that in with a similar kind of a treatment. So we're going to create a darken layer and then um, with, because it's set to darken on the layer above it. And I did, I did a, I did a tutorial on managing your layers and a layer of effects and things because it's set to darken, it's not going to um, make it darker because this gray is, is lighter than this gray. Uh, so going back to our uh, three values, we've got our, our black, our 50% uh, and then our like 20%. You want to go back to having add in our, our black, our, our really strong foreground. There's really no room for a character here unless if we're going for, I guess in some of the old like Zelda shots, they would have, this is usually the kind of shot you want to do for a, uh, like where a hero is facing off against a, um, like the hero versus the city, you know, kind of a thing. And I guess you could do your uh, your trees. Let's grab our tree that we made down here and uh, pop a couple of those into our, our layout here. This creates a really, um, it, it, it communicates a kind of a story that I'm not sure that we intended. And, and so you have to be careful if you're gonna do a, a symmetrical shot like this because it makes the city seem a little bit less ominous. And whereas this shot feels like you're on an adventure and there's like, this massive city that you're going to go and explore. This this shot kind of implies a feeling of confronta uh, confrontation or emergence. 
And also it doesn't give us much room to play around with the distance unless if you do something where you've got like a perspective. Let's pull up our, our red line for notes. So you could do something where you've got like a perspective and you've got your character maybe coming up into the space if you do something with perspective. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about perspective in this. This is mostly about composition, not so much about perspective. Although they do go hand in hand and it is something worth uh, sort of briefly covering. If I were, if I had a client that was insistent that we do something like this, I would probably say, yeah, like we'll put the, we'll put the castle here and then um, maybe raise up the, um, raise up the guy to the middle area or the middle of the shot. But then that sort of destroys the power and impact. It destroys a lot of the impact of our, um, would be essentially moving the horizon up and it sort of destroys the impact of our, our castle almost entirely because we'd have to have this row of trees kind of going off into the distance and then we'd lose our our um, statues and then the focus becomes about that uh, about that central element. I'm not saying these are hard rules, by the way. One thing I should really uh, kind of make a note of is that these are not hard rules. These are not like a, hey, I always follow this. These are just sort of like some tricks that I use to kind of get myself out of a slump or if I can't figure out why some of my compositional things are just not working. Uh, so the next thing I wanna do is I wanna pull up some images I want to pull up some images where I've actually used these techniques. So let's take a look at a painting that I did for, let's see, this one was done for Imagine Effects magazine. And uh, it was, I think the focus of the video that I had done was about colorizing grayscale imagery. But right now we're going to analyze why this image works in compositional terms and some of the, maybe if there are any flaws, we're gonna analyze those things. So one of the things you'll notice is that this is, this, the main character here has a very strong, let's use red, it's a little bit more of a, that pops out a little bit more, I think. Well, wait, maybe yellow. Yeah, no, 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 let's go back to the red. Okay, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that the character has nothing touching him. He's, what, the only things that are touching him are these little bits of cloud and they're very soft contrast. What I mean by that is like, this is very dark, this is very light on the color wheel. And what, that basically just creates this punch. It's like, bam, this is where we're looking. You'll notice also a lot of elements in the scene are pointing at him or in his general direction. You have this kind of going on, pointing at him, the tongue, kind of does this, there's no accident that the tongue kind of curves up at the end. You've got this flow kind of doing this. You've got this that's sort of framing him, but this right here points a lot of your attention. Even the mountain range points at him. The clouds point at him. Almost every major high contrast element in the shot is pointing at him, but the biggest one is this tail. And the reason why this works is because you've got this whole flow of the whole painting anywhere. If you first look at this, the first thing you're going to see is this big dragon head and the, or him, but probably the big dragon head because it's a larger mass. You also have color contrast. So even though this is blue, it's more of actually more of a saturation contrast, but you've got this blue and it's really the only place on the painting where you've got this kind of level of contrast value and color contrast. And then that is really kind of the thing, the arrow, the big arrow that's pointing at the character. Couple that with this flow that comes back around and pulls your eye back up to there. And here you'll notice the importance of this piece is that if your eye does sort of accidentally or even in the peripheral sort of follow this flow, swoops back around, comes back up to the character, or it hits this wall and abruptly stops, which points you back up at the mountains, which pulls you here. So again, everything in this piece, even the most high contrast, most interesting element, which is like a cool monster head, is gonna pull your attention right back to the focal point of the character. So I consider that one mostly a successful piece. This piece was done for a uh, illustrated novel called The Beast of Tuxa, and it was, or it was actually a part of The Man in the Moonkin, which is uh, chapter two or part two of The Beast of Tuxa. 
And it's basically a, uh, the, the setting is that these travelers come out of this very dangerous forest and they uh, happen along a massive stone giant with a village that's been built into the giant. And I didn't want to show the whole giant. I wanted to create a little bit of mystery. So what's working compositionally about this piece? Uh, first of all, this really ties into what I was talking about earlier about the high contrast. You'll notice this would be like that darkest value uh, uh, contrast. And then you'll notice that I actually hit it with an airbrush. I actually made a selection at one point for everything that's in the foreground. And then I, and then I circled this and then I hit this area with an airbrush, which just lightened up that contrast uh, against this background or this foreground element. So that really pushes your focus to this high contrast element. Let's get back to our orange. So this is really where our eye is probably gonna go first, either here or possibly over here. But what's, what's kind of working about that is that it pulls our eye exactly where we want it to go, but then we've also got these trees. Remember, this actually is a really great example of my previous thumbnails because we have these trees We've got these tiny little squares or triangles uh, in the background denoting that there's a sense of scale. So we see how big one of those trees is in comparison to a human scale here. And then we look into the distance and we see, oh man, those trees are about that size. So that means these must be actual like homes, like structures, like buildings. They're probably, uh, you know, 12 feet tall, you know, maybe 20 or 30 feet long, maybe more. Um, and there's probably even people down here, but they would just be so small, we wouldn't really see them. So that makes it seem like, whoa, if this big, huge toe or this big, huge foot is here, then we've really got a sense of depth and scale established uh, in, in doing it that way. Um, furthermore, these, these are probably scaffoldings with the possible elevator or some kind of a structure leading up. Uh, clearly, these are clouds and it's kind of reaching up into the ominous space above the location. Where's all this light coming from? Let's not overthink it. It was mostly just there for composition, but it, hopefully it implies that it's coming in from a little bit off camera. Let's talk about flow. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, elements such as this, that's, uh, this mountain range back here that's pointing to a high contrast location here. And that's kind of pulling our attention right back down to the toe. Now, Technically speaking, we've also got this uh, little flow of buildings here that are kind of pointing us from our person, which is our first thing that we notice, leading the eye to the toe, which is the second thing that I wanted people to notice. Now, ideally, what I could do is something with color contrast here. And I could have done something that had, let's delete that. I could have done something like adding little warm lights down here and making this darker. And that's one way that you can do it is actually have these little uh, high contrast or high uh, saturation contrast in, uh, lights in an area where you want the viewer to notice. But in this case, I, I really just kind of went with value contrast. I didn't do too much with color contrast. Uh, there is a little bit of purple down here. And a big reason for that is because they're coming out of a uh, purple kind of a poisoned forest. But it's also there to kind of give a little bit of offset of saturation color to the scene. So up here we've got a little bit of this almost purple uh, kind of saturation up in the clouds and we've got something that counters that in the opposing corner. So you kind of get this like, um, this would have worked fine if that same purple was up there and it kind of balances out the image. But I, you'll notice that nothing is really too divided down the middle. Let's talk about the specifically the scale of that toe or that foot. Uh, this is a large, if you were to break this into a silhouette, this is a very large element in our scene. And it competes only with that. And this piece probably could have actually been better if they weren't the same kind of mass, the same amount of size, like this whole thing here throughout the whole leg and this. But I feel like it still works because I needed it to be quickly readable as a foot and also a stationary foot with a structure built around it. The reason the structure is built around it, not just for story, is also because, in the way that it's composed, is also because I wanted to pull that attention back up to here. And also note that if this scene were done 
let's just do an experiment. If this scene were done more like a um, normal camera, you'll notice that there is a French tilt on this. If it were more of a straight on shot, it wouldn't be as interesting of a piece. And especially if this foreground element were not also at kind of a faked angle, um, it just wouldn't have as much impact as, uh, as it does with that little bit of French tilt on it. So this was a, uh, this ended up becoming the cover for the Beast of Tuxa. And it's actually, I mean, it's a successful piece in terms of composition and that's why I wanted to talk about it. It's not a successful piece in terms of communicating action, you know, um, and in hindsight, you know, I probably, I, I may end up redrawing this cover if, if I um, re-release the book or, or do a different cover for the book, but it's mostly uh, because it just doesn't have like a menacing feeling of, it, right now it feels like it's a dark forest and it's kind of creepy, but it doesn't really have the impact of an action kind of a setting. And generally book covers really need a little bit more of that. Uh, so let's talk about the, the value contrast. Let's talk about the composition. Let's talk about the rules and, and some of the tips that I put together at the beginning of this video. So first of all, what do we have here? We have a separation of our foreground and background elements. Uh, you know, this is kind of like our, our, our primary focus obviously is gonna go right here first because we've got trees that are pointing at him. You'll notice uh, a lot of elements, even uh, Bartol's tail points directly at this guy. Uh, we've got any flow in the piece is kind of pointing us back to him. And even a little bit of this, even a little bit of Mao kind of pointing as an arrow directly at him. This is the scarf that Mao wears later when you see him in the Kung Fulio painting. Uh, so we've already kind of established that this is the highest contrast point. So we've got this uh, really brightest point in our image is directly behind this guy. And originally he was very dark, but I ended up kind of using a color contrast. This is the only spot on the whole painting where you see this red. And his, uh, his uh, shapes, the shapes that make up his silhouette kind of block a lot of these other things that are coming at him, you know? So because we're disrupting the flow, it forces your eye to turn there. And areas where you want things to be less noticeable, you want things to kind of work with the flow or you want them to um, be softer contrast. You'll notice a lot of things here softer uh, contrast, working with the flow, or they're pulling your eye back to a major element that is controlling the flow. This is our major element that's controlling the flow of this piece. And you'll notice even here at the end, it's like, and you're leaving? No, 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 going right back to Olaf. So, uh, so the flow kind of works pretty well, except that it probably extended to be a little bit too wide. It didn't need to go all the way out here, except that I needed to have these very subtle secondary, you don't even really notice them, something's watching them, and maybe this is part of his body kind of a thing. Um, so if we were doing that, uh, that, that three value kind of breakdown, the thumbnail of this, you would see the, uh, the elements where the characters are standing would probably be your bigger elements. And these actually take up probably more than they should. And I think that's why I kind of dance between backing off a lot of things. So these, this kind of ends up being your highest contrast part portion of your, your, uh, your values. You know what might actually help is if I did this. Let's switch this to a black and white. Zero saturation. Yeah. It still kind of still kind of holds up. This would work just as well if this were filled in. This were filled in. This were filled in. This were filled in. And it might actually take up more space than it should. This is kind of a more complex composition, and not as much here. But you'll notice that this is still only going to be about a third of your drawing. And our values still allow us to keep our focus on what's going on here, but we've got all these spindly little details. The other thing that I didn't really mention before is detail contrast. You don't really work out your detail contrast in your thumbnail, but you can, by the time you get to the end portion, you'll notice a lot of my images tend to get very detail heavy. And you'll also notice that those super detail heavy images 
don't have a background or if there is, it's a very, very simple, almost silhouetted background because I don't want it to compete with the stuff that's the, the important stuff in the image. I don't want it to compete with the main element that I, that I want the viewer to look at, which would be you know, the main character or the details of the main character, the equipment that they're wearing or the, the, the story that the, the gear that they're wearing is telling you. The biggest reason why I wanted to pull this image up though was actually to show you some things that are sort of flawed. And one thing that you should look out for in your own paintings, which are tangents. Um, <clears throat> the, the biggest example of a tangent would be this right here. So I'm gonna use a bright orange to kind of point out. You'll notice that his uh, Bartol's tail almost touches Olaf's walking staff. And that, that, my friends, is what you call a classic example of a no-no uh, tangent. I think it's mostly because these are of the same values. They're at the same distance in, in space, in depth. Uh, if you were to look at the Z space, which is foreground, middle ground, background, they're at the same depth, and they're sort of really close to touching. Either make them touch, in this instance, either make them touch, or make them like separate them out, like create more space here between these two elements. But don't do what I did here ever. Don't do what I do. Just never do, never do what I did here. This is this is this is what is this first year of drawing classes? Come on, what am I thinking? So anyway, uh, the second problem with this is sort of how the the grouping of things I, I was drawing in. You know, the mass of things or the the larger elements in the shot, and I noticed that like this here has way too much. Uh, you know, value contrast, and I technically it would read better if that were a darker element with a with a high contrast light on that stone. That even that would be better. Um, also, these are too bright, and ultimately compositionally, this whole piece could have been done a lot better if it were more of a vertical shot where we see so much more of that creepy forest. And these elements, all the all of our characters were, were down here, like in the bottom of the image. Uh, not the bottom of the image, but if this whole thing were opened up and we actually saw, well, let's just kind of like do a quick little copy paste jobby. What would have made a better composition is if I had done something that's a little bit more like this. And then erase out uh, some of that. And the reason being because then you would get a little bit more of a sense of how big and ominous this forest is and how they're just like these small little, the small little prey in this like place, like a hunting ground almost, you know? Um, and that, that in and of itself, just this, this one little thing, I feel like makes the piece so much better because when we look at how things are breaking apart, let's let's use some of our rules of how we were breaking apart our compositions before. Now it's almost like now it's almost like all of our foreground is this. This whole thing down here becomes our foreground. And we could actually make that better by having more of a fall off here too. And keeping our focal point or our, our foreground element, I guess technically the, this would be, you have to think of this like this is higher contrast is what I'm trying to communicate. So keep this your high contrast element. And then all of all of this then becomes your background. You know, but I didn't do that. Um, and you know, classic, classic uh, little mistake there. I think I just uh, I got carried away with a piece that was going in its own direction and, and I, I had let, let some of my own rules slide. Oh man, you know what would be really great? If I could somehow work in compositionally a little bit more of that sky showing through so that you get that, uh, let's, let's do some airbrush. I am not fixing this right now. Damn it. This is why I don't like to go back to my old pieces because then I wanna just repaint them all. You see how even these subtle little things are already making the piece read so much better because why is that better? Well, because 
one, we're seeing just how big and ominous this forest could be if we have more of these spindly little, um, you know, tree branches and creepy looking, maybe even some like shapes of uh, skulls in the trees or uh, shapes of claws, you know, uh, coming out of those trees if they look like they're just talons from something vicious and gnarly or fangs, you know then that would really uh, kind of drive home the creepiness of this particular location. But also you've got this high contrast lighter element that's really pointing, like creating a, a damn arrow saying, hey, look at Olaf, look at him, look at him, he's right there, look at him. <laughs> and he's the highest contrast, color contrast, value contrast. Uh, actually, yeah, it'd be better if he was a little bit darker too. Highest contrast element, and he's the focal point, but now we lost Mao. Where's he go? Oh yeah, he's just kind of got erased out. Let's put him back in. So right there, that is um, a far better image. Um, we could have the uh, beast of Tuxa more silhouetted into the shot uh, behind the trees, pushing the trees apart here, but keep that all in low contrast so that it doesn't disrupt too much from what's going on here. And maybe bump up the, uh, bump up the contrast so that behind I would probably do a selection if I were doing this. Damn it. Now I want to go back and repaint this one. Ah, oh, well, sometimes you just got to let it go. Maybe the next piece will be a little bit better. Uh, lesson learned from this one. So dudes, that really wraps up the uh, thumbnail and composition secrets uh, that I wanted to share with you. There's a lot of really meaty stuff in this one and it ended up being a lot longer video than I initially thought and I could probably go on about this uh, much more in, in detail, uh, going through a lot more of my paintings and analyzing the compositional flow, the, the setup of the shot. Just try to keep in mind that you want readability from that thumbnail. You know, uh, if your thumbnail is broken, your painting won't work. So don't put the time into a broken thumbnail. Make sure that you've got a good angle uh, and a good uh, separation of your foreground, middle ground, and background. And if you can follow those few rules, uh, your piece is gonna be worthwhile to pursue and put the time in to beginning to add all those details and, and doing all the fun stuff. Um, all right, dudes, that about does it for me on this one. But remember, if you're gonna reveal some secrets to some good composition in your thumbnails, you can reveal some secrets to some good composition in your thumbnails with some freaking passion. All right, dudes. That does it for me. I'll catch you in the next one. Ciao.